Now we're in a series of messages concerning the gospel, the everlasting, eternal gospel of Christ. And remember the gospel is for all ages. And it began in the heart of God before time began. And throughout history, past, present, and future, the gospel uh, prevails. And that includes the final eras and epochs of human history. Because the gospel is for every generation. Now there are many forecasters and predictors and pundits and soothsayers and would-be prophets uh, today describing whether it's political or athletic events. And for example, I, I consider myself quite a prophet because I predicted this year that our Rangers would be in the World Series. Now, the only problem with that is I've been predicting that for the last 10 years. And I also predicted we would win in five, but it was a great win. But I, I'm making the point that if you're really a prophet, you never miss. As a matter of fact, uh, false prophets are identified by being yes and no and up and down on their prophecies. But the Bible, concerning Bible prophecies, uh, bats a thousand every time, never misses. And you know, the Rangers, their theme this year, uh, we saw it again and again, was it's time. It's time. And that's really what Matthew 24 is about. It's about our time. It's about today and this day and that day which is to come when Christ comes again. And the gospel lives and lasts even in the last days. In spite of deception, in spite of dangers, in spite of divisions, in spite of Christ, uh, antichrist and false prophets and all the rest, the gospel of God in Christ prevails even today. No scheme of man, no scheme of hell, no power of man can ever pluck us from our God's hands. And so in Matthew 24, Jesus is predicting the signs, the seasons, the conditions that will exist before he comes again. Now there's a lot of craziness around regarding last things and predictions and, and uh, frankly there's a lot of wing nuts out there regarding prophecy. But what we need to hear very clearly is what Jesus said and what the Bible teaches about these last days. Now let me set this in context before we get to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, this is near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry before the cross. And he has just said to his disciples, looking at that great temple there on uh, the mount in Jerusalem, that there's coming a time when every stone of that temple will be destroyed and discarded and the temple itself would be gone. Now, when he said that, that seemed not just improbable, that seemed impossible because the temple was the greatest structure of the ancient world in many ways. It was a complex of buildings and this powerful place of worship that was established there uh, on the mount in Jerusalem. And the Jews assumed that that temple would be there forever. So when Jesus said that temple is going to be destroyed, there must have been a hush cover the disciples and they wondered is that really true? Well it was true. In fact just a few years later 70 AD Titus the general of the Roman legions came through with his armies and they ransacked the temple and <coughs> destroyed it. They burned it so that the gold that was inlaid within the temple melted and it became so heated that every stone in the temple fell apart. And the stones remained there in disarray and they as Jesus said, they were laying desolate. The stones that were burned, they rolled many of them down in the Kidron Valley. When you stand on the, I wish I'd have brought you a picture today, but if you stand on the Mount of Olives where Jesus is engaging his disciples here, you look through the Kidron Valley and there the Temple Mount. Of course, if you look today to the Temple Mount, there is the Mosque of Omar, which is the third most holy site in the Muslim world. And that stands as a huge stumbling block to the future, one that God himself will resolve when the temple of God, the temple of Israel will be rebuilt one day. 
But that's the background. Jesus is talking about the temple. And so the disciples come to him in Matthew 24 and they said, tell us when all of this is going to happen. Talk to us about the last things. Now remember, they assumed that at this point that Jesus was going to establish as the Messiah his earthly kingdom. That he would reign and rule. That he would uh, conquer the Romans and undo the tyranny of Israel from the Romans and that Jesus himself would uh, be proclaimed as the Messiah and the King. Of course, Jesus did not come the first time uh, to be the Messiah King, uh, but rather the Redeemer King to die on the cross. And he said, my kingdom is within you. Now, ultimately, the new kingdom is coming. And there will be an establishment of the kingdom when he comes as the warrior king, the savior God, and that will happen in the future. But at this point, Jesus is clarifying, and the central message of Matthew chapter 24 is, it's time. Get ready. The message of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, which promises the hope of the future that this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, the angel said, will so come in the way that you have seen him go. Now, the scripture is saturated with prophetic words. You cannot read the Bible without having some understanding of its prophetic word. The Apostle Paul himself said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, or unlearn concerning these things. We need to know as much as we can about the future as God has given us. But for example, and you may want to just write these down as references, one in 30 verses in the Bible have to do with prophecy or the return of Christ. Uh, 300 references in the New Testament alone speak of the second coming of Christ. Uh, it's mentioned 23 of the 27, 23 books of the 27 books of the New Testament. One half of the New Testament is dedicated to future things and the last days. In the Old Testament, of course, the great leaders and preachers and prophets and, and priests and kings such as, uh, such as uh, Job and Moses and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, Daniel, all of these speak of the days that are ahead. And Jesus spoke often of his return and that when he returns there will be judgment upon the earth and that we can look at certain signs and seasons and the convergence of these signs in our own times and have an understanding to get prepared to prepare ourselves for the future. Now, I need to make one thing clear before we get started here with these signs. There is no sign, absolutely none, that needs to be fulfilled for Jesus to come for his own people, his church. Not one. We don't need to look for the rebuilding of a temple in Israel. We don't need to look to these signs that we're about to see, which take place in the tribulation period. But we are looking for the coming of Jesus for us today. For us, I mean the, those of us who have trusted him as our Lord and Savior, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, you know, I, I, I got you a little chart because many new Christians and, and sometimes some of us who have been in church for a long time uh, don't understand that the coming of Jesus Christ is really in two parts. Now, that's a simple way of putting it, but let's say in two episodes. One is when Jesus comes for his church. That's the rapture. You say, is that taught in the scripture? Absolutely. The scripture says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you do not sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. Sleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will be caught up. You don't like the word rapture? Okay, use the words caught up. Will be caught up 
with the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So look up. Your redemption is drawing near. I believe in the immediacy, the imminency of the coming of Jesus for us. It will be suddenly, it will be secretively, it will be supernaturally. We're out of here. That's the rapture. So I drew you a little chart here, and uh, we have it up on the screens for you, I believe. Uh, We start at the cross, and you see there the cross and the resurrection. You might even add the ascension there. But following that is the church age. We are now living in this age, the church. Jesus gave us his spirit, the Holy Spirit. The church is his body on earth. And for these days and years and millenniums, we have been in this period of history, the church age. But then, notice the era upward, that's the rapture. When the church exits, when God's people when believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are taken away, translated into heaven. Jesus talked about this as well as Paul. He said in Matthew 24, you can see it down in verses 40 and 42, then two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left behind. There will be two sleeping in the bed, one will be taken, one will be left behind. There will be two grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. He said, therefore stay awake, for you don't know when the hour of the Lord is coming. And by the way, If anybody tells you they know when he's coming, write them off as a false prophet because Jesus said, no one knows the hour when I come. I looked that up in the Greek. and You know what it means? It means no one knows the hour when I'm coming. (laughs) Nobody knows. So we are to be ready for the rapture. And then after the rapture comes tribulation for seven years. Now this is what you may have heard of as the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a holocaust on earth. It is what the world has always wanted. That's life without God, life without Christ, life without the church. People say, get out of our faces with your witness. Okay? When the church is gone, the world's going to get what it's always wanted, and that's life without God except the judgment of God. And there will be hell on earth. And this tribulation, Jesus would say here in Matthew chapter 24, unless those days were shortened, everyone would die. And what we see primarily, what we see in, in the signs that Jesus indicates here in Matthew 24 are the things that will happen in the tribulation period. But listen to this. If we see these signs converging and concerning in our own generation, we can know that we're getting closer and closer. In fact, Jesus used the words that uh, these signs are like birth pangs. That's verse 8. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Do you see that there? The beginning of the birth pangs. Now, I don't know one thing about birth pangs. Thank God. But I've been told they're not all that pleasant. But birth pangs as you know, begin, and at first they're a a long way apart maybe, and then they get closer and closer together. And they get more intense, and then they multiply, and then through the travail, the baby is born. That's the image that Jesus is using here regarding these signs, that they're like birth pains. When you see these things happening that we're about to read, and they're intensifying, and they're multiplying, and they're ramping up, and they're running harder and harder and harder, you can know that you're getting closer and closer, closer than ever before, to what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. After the Tribulation, where'd my chart go? Uh, After the Tribulation, then comes the Second Coming and the Millennial Reign of Christ. The Second Coming. This is the parousa, which means the coming of of Christ. This is when Christ comes with his saints. We will be with him. This is that moment when he comes to rule and to reign forever and ever. Now, as we say, our God reigns, but this will be his physical presence. Just as Jesus went into the heavens literally, physically, he's coming back visibly, victoriously, to take vengeance upon all the enemies of God. 
And the second coming then will be a time of reign, the millennial reign of Christ. And this will be a wonderful time. But believe it or not, even in the millennial reign, there will be a satanic rebellion. And ultimately, Satan will be cast into the depths of the pit. The final judgment of the world, the great white throne judgment, will take place. And the new heavens and the new earth will be forevermore. And we will be with him forever. And at the travail of Mother Earth, it says, though Mother Earth right now is pregnant and those birth pangs are multiplying and intensifying and one day Mother Earth will give way to a new birth for planet Earth. Now that's a panoramic view of these last days. And the message, remember, is it's time. So get ready. How do we know that it's time? Well, in verse 4, Jesus said to them, this is Matthew 24 in verse 4, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. The first of these signs is what I'll simply call deception. Deception. There will be an explosion of false messiahs and antichrists and cultists and false religions and spiritualists and those who claim to be the way. You know, today everybody's discovering their own path to God and New Age mysticism and other kinds of Eastern mystic uh, philosophies and so on will be uh, cultic in its practice. Many claim to be Christ and have through the generations. But what we see today is religion without Jesus on the rise. Let me underscore that. What we are seeing today is religion without Jesus on the rise. And that's the deception. Ultimately, the final deception will take place when the Antichrist, the man of sin, will be revealed and that is the one who will come with offering solutions. The world's going to be in so much trouble and so much turmoil and so much tribulation and there are no political answers, there are no human answers. This one will rise up as a political leader seemingly overnight. He will be charming and charismatic and, and, and powerful and perform even supernatural stunts with his false prophets and so on. And the world will fall at his feet. Jesus speaks here in Matthew 24, uh, verse 15, of the abomination of desolation. And that is when this Antichrist, like others before him, will set himself up to be worshipped from Jerusalem itself. This one who comes as a savior is really the beast. And he will lead the armies and the forces of evil against the people of God. But Jesus said... Be careful when you see religion without me rising up and false prophets and false Christ and others claiming to be the way. Be ready. That's a birth pain. And then he talks about, he talks about divisions. He says wars and rumors of wars. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of war and see that you are not alarmed for this much takes place for the end is near. Then he said, or the end is not yet. And then he said, for nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Divisions. Now we know that's true and it's always been true. that There have been divisions between nations. But again, what we're seeing now is frightful and fearful regarding the future of the world and the planet Earth. For example, in World War I, uh, not that long ago in the scheme of history, 10 million died, both civilians and soldiers. It was a big number in that day. But in the Second World War, and thank God for the great generation who fought and defended this country in that time, the great generation is moving on in these days, but... We continue to thank you for what you did in the Second World War and the wars that followed, many of you. But in the Second World War, 50 million died. And as we see biochemical warfare and nuclear weapons in the hands of potentially rogue nations, 
Most world leaders will tell you it's not a matter of is it possible that a nuclear weapon will be exploded, but that is probable. That is probable that it's going to happen. And when it does, the world will unleash a firestorm from hell that will be a war, no doubt, to end all wars. But when Jesus says that nations shall rise against nation and this division kingdoms against kingdoms, the idea of kingdoms there is ideologies. There will be a clash of civilizations, a, a war of worldviews, if you will. Now, of course, we're seeing that today between the East and the West, a, a, a conflict of ideologies. But these wars and rumors of wars that we are experiencing today will not compare to the global conflict of the last days when mankind truly is out of control in the tribulation period. No doubt, and when you read, you can read about the tribulation in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. When you read some of the, uh, the signs that are unveiled and the bowls of wrath that are outpoured and all these symbols, it sounds like warfare of the mass kind that, that we have never seen before and the terror of it and the horror of it, the war, the final war will take place. And with the war comes disease and famines. Look at verse 7 of Matthew 24. Uh, the diseases that will take place. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. If you do look at Revelation 6, remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse? You hear about them? And I looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was Death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. Now did you know that 80 million people go hungry around the world every day? No, 800 million, I should say. 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. 95% of these live in developing countries, specifically in the African continent. Disease? AIDS is pandemic. 8,000 people die every day of AIDS. It's a disease that we'd never heard of 30 years ago. And of course, with all this biochemical warfare, no doubt that will take place and so on, there will be new diseases and new ways to die. And then earthquakes, he said. Verse 7, there will be earthquakes. According to the U.S. Geological Society, the occurrence of earthquakes in the world is on the rise, including killer quakes. What's happened in Haiti, and we need to pray for the people of Haiti after the earthquake and now these storms that are attacking them. We, we can remember the storms and the frightful signs of the heavens back at Katrina and so on. You say, well, there's always been hurricanes. There, there's always been storms. But again, the tsunamis and the storms and, and, and uh, the earthquakes that are happening to today, they seem to be ramping up and intensify. Imagine the devastation of the earth during a tribulation period when there are no controls, where the hand of God has been removed from all of nature and all of nature pours out wrath upon the people of the earth. Another thing Jesus says that there will be danger, extreme danger. Look at verses 9 through 12. Matthew 24, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray and because lawlessness will be increased the love of many will grow cold. It is a signal of the last time that it is dangerous especially if you are a believer and a follower of Jesus that the love of many will grow cold. People's hearts are going to get harder and harder. Love will disappear. And again, there will specifically be attacks upon people who name the name of Christ, both before the tribulation and certainly during the tribulation because there will be some who will come to faith in Christ during the tribulation led to faith by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. They will pay the ultimate price in death and martyrdom and blood and tears. But all who live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3.12, will suffer persecution. 
And we can see in our own times, not persecution in America. Now there is perhaps some persecution in America, but around the world, did you know that people are dying for their faith in Jesus Christ like never before? Go online and read uh, the Church of the Martyrs and uh, other websites that talk to you about persecution of the Christian faith around the world, particularly in, in, in countries that are presided over by religious authorities and so on who do not allow the proclamation of the gospel. We've had missionaries related to uh, Southern Baptists who have died for their faith and, and so on, and people in underground churches are dying for their faith. So people are paying the ultimate price more and more. But even here in our country, there's, while there's not as much persecution, there is greater and greater opposition, I believe. And we will see that continue. And I just wonder, when it really gets tough, when it really hits the fan, when, when the, the heat is on, what's going to happen to many church members who, who really aren't living for Christ, they just are sort of a part of the, they're part of the group, but they're not prepared and ready for what is to come. <laughs> you know, one thing I saw with the Rangers ride this year there were a lot of people showing up at fan, as fans that I'd never seen before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bandwagon fans. Hey, I've been out there since 1973 waiting on this. And it kind of ticked me off. <laughs> Not really. I was glad for everybody. But, but, you know, there's some people just get on. I mean, there were Houston Astro fans who came over here and said they were Ranger fans now. I don't mention any names, Chris Cuba, but others, you know, who, who really got on our bandwagon. But, you know, there are a lot of people that are just fans of Jesus. They're Jesus fans. And when the world starts coming apart, you have to wonder where they are. When times get tough or when things go down, Will you stand for Christ against all odds? Now look, you'll be fine. If you, if you remove Jesus from your vocabulary and never talk about Jesus, you'll be just fine. You won't have any problem. But you start talking about Jesus and the gospel, and you will face the flag. You know, the super sign of the last days is what's happening to Israel. And that's really another message, another sermon altogether. But as we see the conflicts of the Middle East, it's all about Jerusalem and the Middle East and the control of Jerusalem and of Israel. 1948, Israel became a nation again. And since that day, the Israelites have been coming back to their country in support of this. And of course, the conflict between the Israelites and the Arab war, war, uh, world is severe. But this was all prophesied in the Bible. Listen to Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. And on that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather around her. That's what's happening today. The focal point is the Middle East. What was the cradle of civilization and the world will become the coffin of civilization and the world. The final battle will be fought there on the plains of Megiddo, the battle of Armageddon. I've stood there. And I remember the first time I went to Israel back in the late 1970s, I was in my 20s in those days and I'd never seen anything like this. And we were standing on top of Mount Carmel where Elijah slew the prophets of Baal and, and we, we went and we overlooked these, these massive fields. And they looked pastoral and calm and I, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, why would anybody fight a final war or a final battle here? I mean, it looks like you could put Disneyland up here to me. And about that time, over our heads buzzed about three Israeli jets and just went boom right through that valley. And it reminded me that what Jesus prophesied 
and said and what the Bible tells us about these final days really is true, that Jesus is coming soon. It's time. Get ready. So when you see all of these signs converging now and knowing that they're going to intensify later in the tribulation, you got to think, could be today. Remember the next thing on the calendar is we're out of here. Perhaps today. No sign has to be fulfilled before Jesus comes for us. But then unleashed is this tribulation and this judgment. Oh, there's one more thing. Verse 14 of Matthew 24. And the gospel, there's our word. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. That's happening today. The gospel is going forward as never before. Uh, The greatest growth in the history of the church is taking place today, right now. Around the world, the churches are some of the largest churches you've ever... I spoke with a Korean pastor who came to visit with me. His attendance in Seoul, Korea is 30,000 every Sunday. And that's small compared to others. And uh, there, there are churches in Africa and churches in South America. And of course the, the large church movement, the mega church. I don't like the idea of mega church because the emphasis is on the wrong place. I like mega ministries. Uh, I, I like the church to be uh, uh, identified by what it does, not how big it is. But nevertheless, these, the, the, the largest churches in the history of American Christianity exist today. And church planting Uh, There's a new focus on planting new churches and multi-site campuses such as as we have. I'm saying the greatest growth of the church is happening in our generation. And there's greater unity of the church than in any any previous generation. The the labels, denominationalism, not denominations. Denominations will exist and and, and may need to. But, But denominationalism, the idea that, you know... Your, your denomination is the only one or the right one or, or, or that people grow up, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Baptist bred, I'm Baptist dead. I mean, that, that kind of thing is going away as people are cooperating more together to get the gospel out. There's more cooperation among churches today of all kinds who believe in Christ and the gospel than ever before. So there's greater unity. There are greater resources media, money, seminaries, pastors, missionaries, books, Bible studies. I mean, can you remember? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Churches didn't have bookstores with resources and, 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 and Christian literature. Freedom of religion is advancing, not only uh, in America where we do have civil liberties and constitutional freedoms, but around the world doors are opening. Economic globalization, opening doors. We're traveling now to countries we've never been before. We've sent groups many years to Romania. Who would have believed behind the Iron Curtain we would be preaching the gospel and going there to preach the gospel? Friends, it is happening. Telecommunications. You can be any part of the world on the Internet today. I'm telling you, the gospel will not fail because Jesus will not fail. In spite of all this downturn, I mean, it's not getting better and better, folks. It's getting worse and worse and worse. But in spite of that, God's gospel will prevail. So, how shall we respond? How shall we respond? I'm turning like five pages of my sermon because this is like a three-hour series and we're ready to go. Number one, believe the gospel. If you don't know Christ, believe the gospel. It's time. We had a gentleman come forward the other day during the Sunday morning service and when the minister said, why are you coming forward? He said, it's time. It's time I give my life to Christ. Friend, it's time. It's past time. If you don't know Christ, you're not promised another day. Neither am I. Today's the day of salvation. Believe. And if you are a believer, believe it more than ever before. Such security in this. I mean, we don't have to live with headline hysteria wringing our hands, wondering what's going to happen next. We know that God is in control of history, that history is his story and his plan is being carried out. And we are, because we are believers, expectantly waiting for him to come. And then live the gospel. Live the gospel. Don't be a weak, emaciated 
half in, half out, lukewarm kind of Christian. Don't be a carnal Christian living for the world because this is all going down. Second Peter 3, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Revelation 3.11, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. 1 John 2, 28, little children abide in him that when he will appear or shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. You know, if Jesus were to come right now, I'm afraid some of us in this room might want to crawl under the pew. We're going out with unconfessed sin in our lives. Our hands in our pockets, never serving God, never contributing to the work of Christ or the church, our tithe in our hip pockets. Jesus is going to come and take us into his presence and reward those who are faithful to him. And some of us are going to think, well, I wish he'd told me he was coming. He's coming. He's coming. So don't live a carnal, selfish, self-centered life. Live for the glory of Jesus and then share the gospel. How can we know these things and not share our faith with others? Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The urgency and the emergency of these times demand that we be faithful in our witness, here in our community and then around the world. And then love his appearance. Paul spoke of those who love his appearing. Be leaning in on tiptoe with expectation of joy. Some people have the idea, well, all you people believe in in Christ and the gospel and the second coming, you got your head way up in the clouds. Well, maybe so, but our feet are firmly planted on fair term. Uh, we're, we're, We're on the earth. We're here. And we've got a purpose until Jesus comes. And let me tell you something. We're loving life because of what Jesus has done for us. Don't you feel sorry for any of us who belong to Jesus Christ. The best is yet. We're living life to the max because Christ is living in us. We are living in joy and faith and courage as we face the future and we can enjoy each day and savor each moment. As as someone said, there are two days on the calendar of the believer's life. This day, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it and that day. That day when Jesus comes again. Paul said, I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So we can live life every day full of hope, full of confidence, full of faith and joy. We can keep on looking up and keep moving onward and upward because we know the gospel of our God and the Savior that our gospel declares lives in us and is coming for us. Get ready. It's time.